In this video, I've got a South Florida truck owner who paid for a rebuild. But after that, he had a lot of problems and suspected that maybe the work that was done was substandard. So he drove it all the way from South Florida up to Idaho to have me partially tear it back down and take a look at the work that was done. Folks, I gotta tell you, this is the worst assembled diesel engine I've ever seen in my 18 years as a mechanic. The amount of missing things, incorrect things, possible damage done to the engine, is quite frankly astonishing folks and this is not a video you are going to want to miss hey guys josh with that babe channel and today we've got a truck that the customer suspects may not have cat parts that were installed although he paid for cat parts to be installed so what we're going to be doing is he's got oil pressure that's dropping under load now there's many causes that could be causing that but of course so what we're going to be looking at is the C15 we have behind me here. It's a really nice Kenworth. So we're gonna be doing, we're gonna be checking the bearings. So we're gonna drain the engine oil, check the rod and main bearings, and look at the oil pump, just see if something's wrong. I know the he didn't get his block plugs replaced when the rebuild was done, so we're gonna do those two while we're at it. So let's take a look at this thing. Now one thing, the outside of this truck looks really nice. The interior is amazing for this being over 15 year old truck i mean it's i think it's an 06 so it's almost 20 years old and it is like new i mean look at this thing this is amazing i, I mean there's not even dirt on the floor really this guy keeps his rig soup this might be the cleanest interior i've ever seen other than you know like a new truck or something but beautiful truck he actually requested that i do a video on this so I am definitely going to uh, acquiesce his request on that one. He drove up from Florida to have me look at it. And then, uh, if you're not sure, Florida and Idaho are not close together. So let's bring her in and uh, take a look at what we got. So first things first, we're obviously going to have to drain the oil if we're going to be checking the bearings here. And also what we're looking for is a couple things. One is, are they cat parts that were installed? That is the customer's main concern also if any damage has been done to the bearings themselves. So we will be able to determine that obviously, but we gotta get the bearings out, which means we have to get the oil out. He's got these quick drains, which are really nice for servicing. They do make me nervous, especially when they're low like this. I wish there was a locking feature for them, but it's a hundred times better than removing the drain plug, checking the drain plug O-ring, retorquing the drain plug. Of course, most people probably never torque the drain plug, but they should. They only torque to about 75 foot pounds, so. I think a lot of people either hit them with a half inch impact but for some reason they're always way tighter than 75 even if you torque them when you go to remove them so getting the oil drained out of here and i might be wondering why are you jumping to the bearings immediately well he had come about a month before and we discussed basically a strategy and he needed an oil change at this time and he wanted to check the bearings so that's what we're doing he even has a quick drain on the little oil pump sump here in the front this is a rear sump oil pan but always have oil there now, one thing I noticed immediately was the block plugs. They were leaking. They were obviously not changed during the rebuild, which is something that you should do during the rebuild. So once the oil's out, we pulled all the bolts for the oil pan and started looking for problems. Now, one thing I did notice, there was nothing in the oil pan other than two broken zip ties, but those are most likely from the top end. So that's a good sign. No large pieces of bearings, no bolts or washers that had fallen in the oil pan. And so I started to decide to start pulling the oil sump pickup tube. And the very first bolt I go to remove is not even tight. Well, that's not true. It's tight. It's just way too long. So he had put one of the bolts that is supposed to be in a different position in this one and just ram it in with an impact. So it had bottomed out. But as you can see, the washer's loose. Bolt's not holding anything. So you can see I've pulled the pickup tube there. And what we're gonna pull now is the outlet tube from the oil pump to the block. And you can see he's got washers on these bolts. They're not supposed to have washers. They're just bolt directly to the tube here, which not, not a huge deal, but that's the correct way to do it is without washers. That's how CAT has it. One thing I'm noticing though is lack of torque striping. Now the mains do have little torque stripes on them, but look at the rod bearing bolts. Or should say just say rod bolts none of them have any markings on them at all and these are not something you just hit with an impact they have a very particular pattern and it's a two-step torquing process so we're gonna have to get this uh 
tube off first and then the ladder plate before we can look at them more thoroughly, but we're gonna just pull this tube here. Like I said, these appear to be to the correct length and they do have washers on them, which isn't a huge deal, like I said. Uh, you know, I, I can't fault a guy for putting washers on the bolt heads, but like I said, from cap, they're not supposed to have washers. So we've got those two out. Now, that tube usually just falls right off when you remove those two, because there's no gasket or sealant on here. And that is normal to have that full of oil. But what, what is this? That's not oil. That is some sort of goopy junk. Did someone put silicone? Or no, this is anaerobic sealant. Someone put sealant on this tube. This tube does not take sealant. It does not take anything. It's a real nasty habit you got there. Yeah. There's no gasket that goes there. It's literally just the tube to the block. Don't put stuff where it's not supposed to be. So you can see we pulled it off here. Look at the stamping on these rod caps and the rod itself. See where the four and four is? Very suspect because that does not look like that was hand stamped. That looks like that was machine stamped. And it seems weird. The rods do not come from cat like that. Now look at the main bearings. This is gonna drive you nuts. So that's seven, right? So what's before seven? Well, you're saying, well, of course, it's six, Josh. Everyone knows six is right before seven on the main caps, right? You know, it's five, six, seven, not three. <laughs> now, folks, usually I don't insult other mechanics, but what the frick is this? You can't count. It's not three, seven. It's six, seven. But he has it seven, three, five. Four, okay, we're doing good. Two, it's not four, two. It would be four, three. So four, two. Where do we got this one? Six. There's our buddy, six. I've never seen this before. Did he not go to kindergarten? He doesn't know how to count between one and seven. It's literally one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Not one, six, two, four, five, three, seven. So I was hoping to just pull a couple of the rod caps initially, see that they were okay. Uh, pull a couple of the main caps, see that they're okay. But now that I see, didn't even put the main caps in the correct order. This is obviously gonna be a problem. So I was, I didn't wanna have to pull the oil pump, but I'm gonna have to pull it now because six is literally above it and six is a number two's position. So we're gonna have to swap those out. And just looking at the bolts here, they do have some weird gunky stuff. I think it's just Loctite though on the uh, bolts there for the oil pump. So he also wanted to make sure because he had been built for an oil pump to see if this was a reman oil pump. So we're gonna be taking a look at that as well. Remember, we're also gonna be looking at the bearing and see if we can find any sort of date stamp on the bearings also if they do end up being cat bearings. So just taking the oil pump off here to get to the mains and they all had that weird donkey stuff. I believe it's just Loctite though, which is fairly normal. I generally use blue Loctite on pretty much all these little bolts that hold the oil pump on, uh, the pickup tubes, the ladder plate, because you don't, last thing you wanna do when you pull a oil drain plug is find that there is a bolt coming out with the oil. So we've got our oil pump off there. Now we can start pulling the mains. Of course, I could have pulled some of the mains, but knowing that I have to pull all of them at this point, most likely, I just wanted to get everything out of the way. I'm also gonna be checking some of the rods, but let's start with the main bearings. So we're pulling, this is uh, the first main we're pulling. It's in the number two position. I have to say that because it has the number six cap on it. And you saw I was putting a rag up there when I was zipping them off. That's because main bolts generally are covered in oil. And when you're hitting them with your impact and they zip off, they fling oil everywhere. And main bearing oil is particularly disgusting in general. Uh, we're gonna find a lot of these main bolts though are quite dry. These ones were not that way they were fairly normal with lots of oil on them and what we're doing here is and if you don't know why it's such a big deal that the numbers are mismatched on the main caps it's because when they make the engine the main caps are put in position and machined 
for the crankshaft in that position. So if you then take them off and move them around, you're gonna have, or potentially could have, slightly more or less bearing gap on different journals for the crankshaft. And of course, you don't want that. You want it to be as consistent as possible. And this is what the lower main looks like. You can see a bit of damage there. Obviously, I'm gonna show you a better close-up on the table here. And folks, these bearings are not very old. They're only a couple months old. Well, a few months. Uh, I believe it was May. April or May was when it was rebuilt. This is November. So you can see we have the number two main cap off there, although it's label number six. But what we're gonna be looking at is the journal itself. Now this one does have torque striping. All the mains do have torque striping. And you can see, yeah, there is some damage to the journal here. And more than likely, although we, you know, folks, we don't know 100% the condition of the journal before the previous rebuild, but that appears to be from some sort of debris in the bearings there. So taking a look at the bearings here, we have the uppers here on top. They have the oil holes. The bolts themselves, so that's number uh, two and three, or it should be, but of course it's labeled six and two. And what we've got here is what appears to be white lithium grease. All of the bolts have white lithium grease on them. It, it, what a period didn't use oil or molybdenum paste, whatever cat says to use. Cat usually says engine oil. He used white lithium grease as a bolt lubricant. Never seen that before, but learning all sorts of new stuff here. Now look at this. Look at the top of the bearing here. Yeah, that was our grinding marks. Apparently number two was hard to install, so what do you do when a bearing's hard to install, folks? You take it over to the grinder. You just grind off as much as you need until you stick that bearing in there, right? No, no, that, that is not what you do. And the good news is these are cat bearings and the date stamping looks like they're from 2022 manufacture date. So the mechanic that worked on this, while not being the best installer of bearings, uh, it's not fraudulent. He did put cat bearings in this uh, engine. Now look at that. What the heck? Look at where the oil hole is. There's a big old line there. It would appear he was like a pocket screwdriver and just rammed it in. I'm, I'm running out of different effects for screaming here, folks. So many problems. Yeah, it looks like when he was rolling them in, he used a very small screwdriver and hammered them in there. Not what you want to do. Obviously, any debris damage to the top bearing is going to get forced in the lower bearings. That's probably why the lower bearings have so much debris and damage to them. This one, they're all from 2022. Look at all the, the little specks of damage that's from debris. And yeah, every single upper was like this. He must have used a small screwdriver and really forced them in firmly, probably hit them with a hammer or something. Not sure it wasn't there, but yeah, doesn't look too good. So number five position here, same thing. They have the damage to the oil ports on the upper bearings from being installed roughly with a very small screwdriver. Now folks, a lot of people, including myself, can use, although I use a very large screwdriver, but I don't ever push like that to install them. I usually use it for positioning. The tab itself is almost a third missing there in that section too. Probably didn't have it aligned properly when he pushed it in. So big scratch there all the way down to the copper. Yeah, and. The uppers are hard to install in C15s, I'm not going to lie. And like I said, a lot of people, including myself, you can use a screwdriver. I try to use the biggest one I have. You have to be very particular where you're using it. You don't want to push on delicate surfaces. Like I said, mostly what I do is I use it for positioning. I'll try to move the bearing to the center of the journal. A lot of times I find when the journal or the bearing's hard to install, it's because it's not in the center of the journal. Now what we're doing here is we're looking at what is labeled the number three cap, but it's in the number six position. And we call this first person mechanic because I've got a chest game on, so you're gonna see what I'm doing. Well, he definitely didn't under tighten any of the main caps. They were all pretty tight. And just getting them off here. The main bolts are the only ones with any sort of torque striping on them. And as you can see, they're pretty dry. Uh, white lithium grease on the threads here. Not the correct lubricant. Like I said, I've never seen bolts lubricated with white lithium grease before. And 
Later, I'm going to be doing the uh, overhead, and yeah, none of the head bolts have uh, torque striping on them. The uh, You can see the rods, yeah, none of the rod bolts do, and later you'll see why it's so important on the rods. I'm looking at the journal there. So once our bolts are loose, we can now take the cap off, inspect the bearing for damage, which all the other bearings are damaged, so... It's likely this one's damaged. Also, if the cap won't come off easily, usually walking it back and forth seems to work. You don't ever want to leave the caps without a bolt in them if they're above head. Always keep a hand on the main caps. They're very heavy, and if you're under there and it falls on your face or something, oh gosh, look at the oil. I got all, all over the place. Mostly just on me. Mains are not the best, uh, most fun job for sure, folks. Not my, uh, not my favorite thing to do, but, you know, it's part of the job. So, yeah, we got our main is finally off. Like I said, that should be the number six main, but, of course, it has the number three main cap installed on it. So, now that's off. What's our damage look like? Hey, look, a bunch of uh, scratches, most likely from debris in the oil from the upper bearing, most likely, from it being roughly installed. So, we've got the cap here, and just taking a better look at it now that we're out from underneath the truck and yeah huge vertical scratch right there into the copper no good so i just rolled the upper out and I'm gonna take a look at that of course it has the telltale signs of being pushed in with a small screwdriver most likely hammered in or forced way harder than it should have been the just looking at the scratches here on the journals actually look worse than they actually are except for number two and number six position they have some ones you can actually feel so those will have to get resolved a little bit but this is the uh actual upper itself like i was saying it's got the you can see pushed in with a small screwdriver uh roughly thanks for doing here is the rods we're gonna pull off two of the rods take a look at them and see how bad they are now if you don't know the rod bearings get oil from the crankshaft, and the crankshaft is supplied oil by the main bearings, because if you think about it, oil is fed into the engine block, and then the engine block supplies it to the upper mains, which feed it to the crank, and then the crank feeds it to the rod. So if you had debris going through your main bearings, you more than likely have debris going to your rod bearings, so the rods are more than likely going to have to be replaced, the bearings themselves. So taking a look at the bolts here, white lithium grease. Cat says to use engine oil on these, for assembly. Like I said, it's weird. I've never seen someone use lithium grease as a bolt lubricant. And I'm not even necessarily saying that in a bad way. I don't know if lithium as a bolt lubricant would be a good choice as a bolt lubricant. I've never really looked at it because Cat never says to use it. They always say to use oil or molybdenum paste generally. So uh, I'm not sure why he uses lithium grease. But probably use lithium grease for the bearings themselves that's very common for assembly so maybe he thought i'll just put it on the bolts like i said i'm not really not really faulting him for that just it's very weird i've never seen that before so we got the uh number two off there now we're going to be pulling number five and one of the weirdest things was the stamping on the side of the rods it's never seen such good stamping i'm i'm wondering if the only thing I'm wondering is if the rods were reused, but I, there's no way to verify. There's a serial number on them. I actually contacted Cat with the serial number to see if there was a date timestamp. They were not able to give me any information as far as when the rods were manufactured because or remanufactured. If they were able to tell me, hey, these were made in 2022, obviously, that would mean they were had been replaced. The customer suspects that maybe they got reused. There's really no way to tell, though. They do have cat stampings on them. The bearings are from 2022. So, uh, Like I said, while I'm not a big fan of how he assembled this engine, as far as I can tell, he did use all the cat parts that he said he'd used, the rods being the only question mark, and the weirdest thing being the stamps on the sides of the caps, which I'll show you later. So we got the rod caps off there. You can see I pulled the piston cooling jet because I'm going to be pushing these two up and rotating the engine around to pin it. So this is what the uppers look like. Pretty bad for rod bearings, especially newer rod bearings. Rods and mains are opposite, so rods generally wear on the top and mains generally wear on the bottom. 
and these are the uppers on the rods and yeah no good so a customer also wanted an overhead dud just to check and see what the heck's going on there he said it hasn't been running right really since he picked it up and there was no markings on the overhead to indicate that it had been torqued or checked look at the paint overspray so much paint overspray on the the uh valve springs there no torque stripes on the head bolts but i guess when you paint everything so much that it literally gets on the inner valves that you know you don't really have to torque stripe the head bolts maybe that was his reasoning they're not really sure but like i said there's no indication that an overhead was done i did check all of the injector nuts just to be sure because those can be under torque and they'll back off and then you'll have an engine miss but these were all tight they were actually probably too tight because setting them at 22 inch pounds here they all click without moving so did he torque these i have no way of telling or would he torque them to definitely seems like they're slightly over 22 inch pounds though but at least they're not too loose so getting to the next thing is the overhead now checking the injectors here they were all actually except for number two so number two is the only reman injector all the other ones were original that one was way off about a quarter inch depth off but all the other ones i checked like this one on number five actually not too far off they were pretty consistent they were all a little bit low but some people like to run a little lower or higher than i do so can't really fault them for that but yeah number two so what it, you can see number two is white solenoid there uh I, since that had been replaced i don't think he checked it now look at this i have the feeler gauge in there You can still move the rock around. It still rocks with the feeler gauge in there. Now, overheads are subjective. If you can still move the rocker arm, though, up and down with the feeler gauge in there, that's not good. There's no way that was adjusted. That is way far out of adjustment. And this is when I discovered paint where it's not supposed to be. Where is it not supposed to be? Well... On the camshaft. Now, what I'm trying to do here, you can see the paint on the uh, injector harness there, is trying to show you the paint on the camshaft. I don't want to have to pull the rockers to do that. Obviously, I'm not going to do that. But, yeah, I I don't know. I've never seen paint on a camshaft, folks. I mean, look. You can see it here. here watch this. Right there. You see it? You see the cam lobe? Look at that. There's paint all over it. In fact, the only clear place with no paint is where the lobe actually is lifting the rocker arm so it's actually scraped off the paint there it seems like all the lobes have it look at that it's on the base circle it's all over the place what the heck how do you paint so much that you paint over the camshaft obviously camshafts not a part you want to be painting folks now even though we're pretty far into this video already how about a little destruction of the week So you might be wondering, well, don't you already have a destruction of the week? Well, our buddy Nick in the shop here said, hey, you need to come take a look at this differential. Making a lot of noise when accelerating. And yeah, yeah, that's not that ring gear is looking pretty bad. But that's actually not the worst part of the damage here. Look at these chunks they pulled out. These must be off the pinion. But look at those huge pieces of differential just coming apart you know you might be saying well there's not much of a scale here well how about i put a coin next to it just to show you how big these pieces were this truck drove in here by the way so yeah that's how big the pieces are look at that that is crazy man feel bad for that guy hey guys so it's the final morning working on this truck here and what do we got left we got two rod caps and we have all the mains i did the overhead yesterday got all that up to speed it looks like only from what I see now, one of the mains needs polished. You might be saying, well, don't you want to polish any scratches out? If you can't feel them, you really don't need to address them. The human finger is actually very delicate to very small scratches, stuff like that. But also, you, it, when you say polish out a scratch, what do you mean? Because remember, a scratch is into the material, which means it's below the base layer of material. So can you polish that out? How would you polish a low spot? You would have to remove the layer around it down to the point of the scratch. So really what you're trying to do is if you were to gouge a piece of metal, you're going to get a scratch which is below the layer. But also you're going to get little raises next to that adjacent scratch. So 
really what you're doing is you're trying to knock those down and the low spot will always be there unless you undersize the journal, which obviously you can't do in chassis. So we'll probably polish and up polish in at least that one, which is the number two position. And we'll see if one, four or seven also needs it, but let's get to work. So these are the two rod caps we pulled off. And mostly what I'm showing you here is the stamping because I kind of want your opinion on this. Look at that six. Do you think that could be done by hand? I I've stamped lots of stuff with a hand stamp for numbers and especially on a rounded surface like that. To me, that looks like a machine did it and it perfectly matches the top stamping on the rod also. All of them have them as well. Kind of wanted to get your guys' opinion on it. Maybe I'm just a bad stamper. So putting our new rod bearings on now, this is the upper, and this is for number six. So their rod bearings are pretty easy to install. The mains are much more difficult generally, at least the upper portions are, because the rods, you just kind of roll them in place and then you pop them in place. Now I use, like I said, I use a screwdriver. I, you have to know what you're doing though, folks. You can't just scrape it into everything. Some people say they use wood or brass. You know, if they made like a hard brass screwdriver, maybe I would use that. But uh, this is a quite a large wide tipped blade and really you just have to be careful where you're putting it. So I like to push on the tab because the tab is raised from the crankshaft. And really what I'm doing is I'm just seating it into the rod. Notice I'm not scraping it against the journal and you can't even see a mark on the bearing when I'm done. Unlike the uppers on this one where they're literally gouged like a quarter of an inch into the bearing. I don't believe you could do that by hand. I'm almost wondering if he used a hammer or just really pushed hard and it was a really small screwdriver. I'm not sure, but what we're gonna be doing is putting on the uh, rod cap now going to be using engine oil he probably used white lithium grease i mean he used it on the bolts but um cat says to use oil i used to use white lithium grease but you know what folks i've been using oil now for a couple years and no problems with it. it's less messy also than the white lithium grease you're also supposed to use oil on the rod bolts one of the most expensive things on this repair was i ordered all new rod bolts for the customer you can reuse rod bolts. It doesn't say you have to replace them on, at least on this engine. But since there were no torque stripes, I have no idea if he had over or under torqued the old bolts. So even though it had cost some money to replace the bolts, it's probably a lot better than throwing a rod because you reuse the rod bolts. So if this had been a factory built engine, I probably would have just reused the rod bolts. Normally, I'm not doing bearing rolls. Cat does not recommend it on these C15s. The only reason we're doing it is because the bearings are damaged. But uh, I thought it'd be a lot safer reusing or not reusing the rod bolts. So just going to run them in here. I'm going to zip it down. We're not hammering on this, folks. Uh, this impact, especially with an extension, doesn't put out a ton of uh, torque anyway. We're going to get all four seated. And then we're just going to torque them in the proper procedure, torque stripe them and then do the rod bearings, do the rest of them. Obviously, I'm not going to show you doing all of them. This video is quite long. This ends up, this is going to be the longest in-shop video I believe I've ever done, which, you know, if you guys think it's too long, just let me know. Um, the customer wanted this video, so I'm trying to give him uh, his best bang for his buck here. I mean, he drove up from Florida to have me do this repair, so. So we're going to be torquing these. Now, these torque to... 50 foot pounds and according to the cat literature you're supposed to torque the front two which they label a and c for some reason so they torque the 50 then you go to the back two which are labeled b and d in the cat literature and you torque them then you're supposed to torque turn the rear two b and d and then torque turn the front two what i like to do is i like to torque them all twice just to be sure. And I always like to check the rod gap also between the cap and the rod just to make sure that they are uh, seating properly. These aren't fractured rods, so there'll be a slight seam. Then look at that. Hey, torque striping. Imagine that. So these have all been torqued now, uh, twice actually. Now we're going to torque turn them. Now there's a variety of ways to torque turn them, but I found the easiest way is using the snap-on one here that will actually read you and give you the torque without, you don't have to look at it even, it's pretty nice. So you just rotate it around and it'll tell you the torque, you preset it. So mine's preset to 60 
degrees, which is what cat tells you to torque them, turn them to. And like I said, it was you start at the first two and then you go to the rear two. So torque turning this pretty nice, pretty nice torque wrench here. Quite expensive though, but it, it allows you to, and this is the reason I bought this torque wrench is because it allows you to do torque turning. Now I've noticed there seems to be sometimes a little bit of degree difference if you're comparing it to just say stripes on the bolt heads, uh, slightly off, slightly on, but then you're supposed to retorque the first two before you torque turn them, so that's what I'm doing here. But I've done uh, quite a bit of testing since that first time I was using it, and um, even though it might be off by one degree, uh, I'm sticking with the ratchet. You get, a, or this torque wrench, you get a lot more consistency out of using it. You don't have to worry about setting up a dial indicator, uh, torque striping your bolts, and then turning them to a mark. So that's what I'm doing here. So yeah, we're all torqued. And if you look, it's putting out anywhere from about 80 to 85 foot-pounds at the final torque there. But it doesn't really change that much. So as you're turning it, I believe the bolt's just stretching more and more, and it's not actually applying more and more torque. It's not like the, the main where you it just gets tighter and tighter. The rod goes to a certain torque and it just seems to stretch after that. So torque striping in here. One thing I always like to do with rods is make sure they move a little bit side to side when you're done. That means they're not seized. Yeah, it might be hard to tell, but yeah, this one does. It's very minute. It's like maybe a 64th of an inch, but they do have a little bit of uh, end to end play there. So that one's good to go. So we've done all of our rods here. You can see they're all torque striped, all torque turned, clean, new bolts, new bearings. And what we're gonna be doing now is polishing, which is not my favorite thing. And it's, I don't think it's very effective generally, but when you have damage like this, there's actually nicks in this crank. It's not just the lines from the debris. So nicks like that, we're gonna have to polish them down because they will wear into the new bearing and send debris out through the new bearings, which is not good. Now, can you ever get the factory finish by hand polishing? Not really. I mean, from the factory, it's gonna be the best it's ever gonna be, and all you can really do is try to keep it up to that standard. As you can see, there's the same dings on here. So it was only two, uh, it was number two position and number six that had these dings, not sure why. Now you might be wondering why I have two earplugs with circles around them. The reason is because I install those into the oil ports in the crank when doing polishing so you don't get sandpaper, debris, and metal into the oil ports on the crank. And why I do the circles there is because at the end of the day, there needs to be two earplugs in those circles because the last thing you wanna do is leave one of those in there and then put the main bearing on. That would toast this engine, so. It is a, uh, I'm sure some people just polish away without doing that, but I I like to do that. That's uh, someone named Mike. Uh, Mike K, we'll call him, taught me. Cashman Cat. And uh, yeah, so what we've got here is some inch and a half crocus cloth. It's a thousand grit. You could start with a, a lower grit number if you wanted to and then work your way down. I generally like to start with a very high grit and then just polish. Like I said, you're just trying to get it back close to factory. It's never gonna be as good as it was from the factory. So what you've, you can see the earplug is installed in the oil port there, and you're just gonna feed it through, and always give yourself quite a bit of length on the uh, sandpaper here. You don't want a very short piece, because you'll be there all day. So what I've done is I've rotated the crank to where that damaged portion is actually on the top, because you can't really polish from the bottom. I guess you could if you just add a little piece, but then you're doing it very inconsistently. I like to lubricate the sandpaper. It helps doing this, but it also allows you to rinse off the debris easier, I feel. And you know, you're not removing much material here, folks. Like I said, you're what you're trying to do is just knock the high points off next to where the damage is. You're and I'm just rotating in here. So what I'll do is I'll give it a Give her a few turns and light pressure, or not light, I'd say moderate pressure. You're not pulling down, you don't want to rip the sandpaper in half, but you also need to apply enough pressure for an even finish. Then I'll just rotate it a little bit uh, here and there. And then we're gonna have to rotate the engine around, take a look at it. If it's still there, if it still catches your nail, then you're gonna have to 
rotate it back up there and polish it some more. Now, polishing isn't something I do every day, uh, luckily, because normally it's not bad. Now, you might say, oh, I could still see the dings. Yeah, the dings are into the journal. You're not going to get rid of those. Um, if you've been a machinist your whole life, you could get rid of those somehow, but you can't really get rid of them unless you remove the base material. So I can still feel it slightly, so I'm going to have to rotate this around again and polish them again. You can see it has smoothed out the journal. A lot of the lines that were on the journal are now kind of gone, but those lines, you couldn't even feel them. They are almost just cosmetic but the dings there are definitely not cosmetic so do our best to remove those so we we've polished again you might be saying well it looks pretty similar maybe the uh the smaller dings there look smaller but yeah it it feels better and mostly what you're doing here is by feel your fingers are very sensitive as i said to small imperfections in uh flat materials so my nail is no longer catching. Before, if I scraped it across there, it would catch on there. Obviously, they're still uh, gouging into the journal there, but the high spots have been knocked off. So those are those are what would damage the bearing. So that's gone. And kind of the same with the other one. So you can see I've installed the upper on number six. It was quite easy, actually. Number six rolled in very easily. I'm not sure why he pushed it in with a screwdriver. So what we're going to be doing now is installing a main. I'm going to show you how to install a main. I've got videos on how to do it already, but you know, if you're watching the channel, folks, you obviously like to see me work. At least I hope so. Or maybe you don't like to see me work and you just like to see me suffer laying under a truck dripping oil on me all day. Either way, watching helps the channel. So did number six there. We actually put the cap on that matches too. Uh, weird, huh? So we've got your upper here. Uppers and lowers are not interchangeable on main bearings uh, some rod bearings they are but not this guy so what you're doing yeah you're just rolling it in so you start with the non tab side you roll it in on the tab side of the block and you can see this one's actually rolling in very nicely so sometimes they are quite difficult so I understand I understand why the previous guy put so much force into getting some of those in there but you shouldn't have to so this is the same screwdriver like I said you have to be careful. You have to know what you're doing when you're rolling these in. Now, you might be saying, well, you're not supposed to use a screwdriver. Well, I mostly use it for positioning. So if you see me here, I'm not I'm not sticking in this in the oil hole and running it up there. What I'm trying to do is just seat it. And mostly what I'm doing is I'll push on the tab itself. But mostly I use it for positioning. So if you see, I'm not pushing the bearing necessarily with the screwdriver as much as going next to the bearing. Because the hardest part about getting the bearing in, as you can see I'm doing here, is keeping it centered in the journal. If it starts getting into the fillets, which are the ends of the journal, it starts getting harder to push in because it's pushing the bearing into the crank. So mostly what the screwdriver is for is positioning the bearing, not necessarily forcing it in. If you have to push really hard with a screwdriver, something's wrong and you shouldn't be doing that. So we've got our new lower now on. And we've got the correct one in place, although this is number five, so it actually had the correct one in place before. So, now I mentioned this before, don't ever, ever trust the main cap to stay up in place. They are very tight-fitting usually in there, even with the bolts out. But what you don't want to do is, oh, it's seated, let me, uh, let me grab the bolts, let me take my hand off. Always keep one hand on that main cap. That sucker is heavy, and it's cast iron, and it will smash your face and knock your teeth out. So, yeah. What I like to do is try to seat it by hand. Once it's seated, I really don't want it to move out of place either because it could pull the bearing out of the cap, which I'm trying not to do. Then you just start with one bolt and try to get it started. Now, there are fine threads, so sometimes they're tricky to get started. These bolts are lubricated with engine oil on the threads and under the washers and under the head of the bolt. You're saying you got a lot of light flare here on your camera, Josh. Well, yes, this is a very dark, hard-to-position uh, camera shot here. I'm using a, it's kind of a chest cam. Got my trusty cat screwdriver. You can tell it's actually snap-on screwdriver, but cat branded. And what I was doing there is the main caps are not dowed or anything, so they can kind of swing all over the place. So I was just trying to center them. So just running these in with my little 3.8s. These torque to quite a bit. So these torque to 190 foot-pounds and then 120 degree additional turn. Now, 120 degrees is not the temperature outside here. Here in Idaho, it is a cool 30 degrees with about 12 inches of snow over the last uh, 
24 hours here, first big snow of the year. So now what we're gonna do is torque these suckers. Like I said, 190 foot-pounds. Now one other thing that's nice about this snap-on super electronic torque wrench is it's a really long handle. You might be saying, well, why does that matter? Well, when you're doing 200, close to 200 foot-pounds under a truck, having a handle that's even six inches longer is pretty nice. And you can kind of see it swinging in there and out. Yep, there we go, 190. So yeah, you do 190, you start on the numbered side and then you go to the other side. I've already switched, you can't really tell because of the position of the camera. 193, no big deal, three foot pounds over. Then you gotta torque turn them. And you, while you could, I and I have torque turned these by hand, uh, generally I use an impact wrench, it's just so much easier. As long as you're watching what you're doing, you still have to only turn it 120 degrees and the way you're gonna do that is this half inch torque wrench wouldn't torque turn these anyways. You'd have to use a three quarter inch torque wrench, but it will tell you. And what I do is I mark, and then I'll mark two notches off because two notches on a six sided bolt is 120 degrees because 120 times three is 360, right? Math, stuff like that. So then I'm gonna use my trusty air impact wrench And you can see I've got three lines on our fancy socket here. And the reason I've got three lines on the socket is because 360 divided by three is 120, which is what I'm trying to torque turn it to. Sorry, not the best camera angles. Like I said, folks, it's hard to, this is a very particularly hard thing to film here because you're working, but you're also trying to show you what you're doing. And there we go. See, not that bad to torque turn these guys, especially if you lubricate the bolts properly. And that's with engine oil on this cord and a cat. Torque strafe them, good to go. Now, one thing you wanna do anytime you do a main is rotate the engine slightly to make sure it didn't seize. This one turns normally. There we're done with our rod bearings. We're almost done with our main bearings. We're about half done. Uh, I got one more to polish and four more to install. I don't know if anyone's watching the new Squid Game, the challenge, the actual game show one, but anyone does main bearings, definitely looks like you've been eliminated. We're getting close to it here, folks. So what we're doing here is this is number two position. This is, and it has some of the uh, worst damage on the journal there. I have polished it now, and you can still see some of the little nicks, but like I said before, not Tut, they're not catching my fingernail anymore. You can also see a lot of the lines are gone. Still has some of them there, but like I said, most of the lines were actually cosmetic, luckily for this customer. So those are pretty much gone. The nicks are, while the little nicks into the crank are still gonna be there, there's not much you can do about that. So we're gonna roll, trying to roll number two in, and man, it is extremely difficult. You can see where it stopped there, right at the part number line. So I got it in about half an inch and it just stopped. And I think I found what the problem was. Now, this is the one the customer had ground the bearing down. So am I gonna do that? Of course I'm not gonna do that. So looking at the block itself, I believe I know why he had so much trouble. It's hard to tell. Uh, you can't really see it in this image, but basically there was kind of a lip from the casting right where you would insert the uh, upper and what I had to do was just take a little bit of the, uh, there's kind of a lip on there, it's not supposed to be there, just shave that off just slightly with it, like a, basically a nail file and yeah, rolled in normally, just clean it up with some brake clean. This is the thrust bearing. Here's something I've never seen before. Literally hit. There's almost never wear on a thrust bearing. It's hard to see here. Look at that. There's notches out of this thrust bearing. He, I don't know why you would do this because they literally roll in. You could use a toothpick to roll these guys in, but. Definitely been eliminated now. Look at that, man. So if you're wondering if I pressure prime this, of course I did. I try to pressure prime every rebuild. And while this isn't a rebuild, uh, with the amount of bearing damage and stuff he'd had done, I 100% pressure primed his engine before starting it. So hopefully we'll have instant oil pressure after. So that is gonna start. Of course, it's gonna start. It didn't really do much with that part, but how long is it gonna to take to get oil pressure? What's his oil pressure gonna be? Mm -hmm. 
Not too bad, pretty much instant oil pressure. Uh, yeah, like I said, it just had to take the, the lightest little lift that's not supposed to be there on the block off to get those bearings in. One and two are extremely hard to roll in though on the uppers. Not sure why, uh, but you should never grind the bearings down. Yeah, like something was up with the casting there, but you know, uh, good old silicone on that seal, great. And I hope you guys enjoy this video. The customer let me know the engine is running way better. The oil pressure at idle is higher. However, it is still losing oil pressure under load it's by a couple PSI. So probably the best he's going to get. Want to pick the winner today for last week's video? It's going to be Scott L. Scott L here. 346 is my favorite engine. It has a great history and reputation. Sure does. Scott L, please send me an email and we will get your Western States uh, gift bundle sent out to you. As always, super long video, but thanks for watching. Thank you.